Welcome to my Accent is No Accident podcast. I am Maritza Perez, your host. And today we are with Kevin Strauss from Emotional Health and Innovation Consulting and CEO of Ushi LLC. Kevin is an Emotional Health and Innovation Consultant. He is CEO of his company Ushi. LLC, he focuses on what drives behavior and is dedicated to making life easier and happier. Kevin's career began in biomedical engineering, finding problems and solutions, which has led to 80 patents, 10 plus research publications, two innovation awards and his book, Innovate the 1%. Kevin has worked in human behavior for two decades and has identified emotional health as its driver and human connection as, as its primary supporter. Uchi is an app he created to nurture authentic connection. Kevin is also a 22-year injury-free Ironman athlete and coach. Kevin is an honor to have you as a guest on my podcast. Thank you, Maritza. I'm excited to be here. You are a diversity, equity, and inclusion champion who believes that is what nurtures your emotional health is diversity, correct? Yes, when we feel included and our diversity is celebrated and we feel more equal to one another, there's more equity in our relationships, then we feel more value. And feeling value translates to feeling loved, and that is nurturing our emotional health. Because when our emotional health is not being nurtured, and this is what I've learned over 22 years, when our emotional health is not being nurtured, it causes pain. And in order to ease our pain, that's when we turn to behaviors all time. Kevin, what is your accent and why is not an accident? <laughs> so my accent and, and my story, um, it really, it's funny. It really is not an accident. I think when you look back, when I look back through my life and, you know, I'm in middle age now. If I look back to my early childhood, I was very intuitive, very empathetic, very sensitive as a child. But I grew up in a home. If those of you out there are familiar with the Myers-Briggs, like personality assessments and, and so on, my home was my parents and my older brother and sister are SJs. So I was an N intuitive living in an SJ world. So my intuition and my like feeling and compassion was constantly being suppressed by the SJ world of my parents. And, and it's interesting because that led me down the road to engineering, which, you know, biomedical engineering and, and designing implants for spine surgery and so on. And that's a very SJ type career. And, but it was through in my adult life when I started to question 
Why do I do what I do? Why do I behave the way I behave? Why do other people behave the way they behave? And going down that path and observing people, all kinds of people, and myself, and asking the hard question, that's when basically I had an epiphany in December of 2001, epiphany for me, realizing or seeing that that conflict between people seemed to be rooted in our inability to really share our thoughts and feelings. And that's how, that's what the idea for Uchi, it was under a previous name, you know, back in the early 2000s. But I thought if we can help people really share their true thoughts and feelings so that they could feel heard and understood, then we'd have less conflict, less hate, more love, more connection, more belonging, and better behaviors. And in the last 22 years, I've shown time and again how that works. And there's a lot of other research out there showing how feeling connected improves behaviors of all kinds, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, bullying, um, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, suicide, all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was, the story is growing up, not being true to myself because I was in an environment that was very opposite of me and being sort of guided by that environment, but then coming out of that in my late 20s, 30 years old, and really finding my true self and honoring my true self, my empathy, my compassion, my intuition, my sensitivity, and and taking that forward, which is to helping everyone connect. And then the last thing I'll say on is, my parents didn't understand me. They are SJs. I am an N. I'm intuitive. I'm empathetic. I'm more sensitive. They never understood me. I never felt heard and understood. So Uchi is really my way of solving my problem to feel heard and understood, to feel like I matter and like I'm valuable to my parents. And it turns out a lot of other people feel the same way. Yes. I think that. I resonate with that story. I, um, we were talking prior to the start of the recording and I'm Catholic. And as I grew up, I was told, um, and at school, I went to Catholic schools to love, 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 love. <laughs> and then I go out there and there is not much love. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of division. There is a lot of discrimination mm -hmm. and uh, to see other people that call themselves religious doing that as well was very confusing to me. So I came to the, to the conclusion that religion is not who you are and, but it's just what you practice. And it might help you set values for your family, but it doesn't really define you as a person. Yeah, and it doesn't really seem like it's nurturing people the way it was perhaps originally intended, although I would call that into question too, but let's just assume that it really was all about loving and taking care of each other and having that community, that sense of belonging, right and now it's it's like all about bliss of it where my religion's better than your religion or i'm better than you because i'm this religion not that religion and it all becomes this way that we value ourselves or value each other or devalue each other um and religion is just another way that we do it you know we we value and devalue each other by gender, by race, by by socioeconomic status, by athleticism, by attractiveness, whatever that means, by color, right? And it's just all these different ways that we value or don't value ourselves and each other. Exactly. And so I, I resonate with you because then you start looking for 
a community that nurtures that part that is lacking that you're like, I don't know. I want to be this whole self. I I am looking for something else. Um, so I resonate with you and that is so um like when I hear you talking about how to nurture your yourself and your emotions because that will set your behavior. Uh it it's so true. And then we see it every day. I mean <laughs> every day, every hour, every minute. I mean it's it's a basic need, right? Like that's that's where I really as I, I keep whittling down, you know, like keep asking why, 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 and I keep whittling it down. And that's what I do. That's how I solve problems. That's how I came to like 80 patents and all these publications and everything is really identifying the true root cause of the problem. And what I've learned is that if you really identify the true root cause, the solutions turn out to be quite simple or the solution, a solution turns out to be very simple. And to me, what I see in the world is that we haven't identified the true root problem. And that's why we keep struggling with all the racism and prejudice and um, tribalism and um, pitching, you know, one group against another, however you want to define the group, right? And it just keeps perpetuating because, and then we keep behaving in ways to try and compensate and that's when we turn to drugs and alcohol and food or not eating food and gun violence and and um, bullying and depression and anxiety and suicide. I mean, I could go on and on, right, about ways that we try to compensate. This is It doesn't matter what color you are or what religion or what gender or it, none of that matters because all of these things affect everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a movie star, you still might die by suicide. Yeah. Right. Or you could be, you know, in poverty, homeless and die by suicide. And like, it doesn't matter because there's a basic need that's not being met across humanity. And to me, it's the love, connection and belonging. And that's how I define emotional health is our ability to give and receive love, connection and belonging. But like back to the religion, example, so much of religion is driven by shame and judgment that's not love and connection shame and judgment is pain right and a person will do anything to ease their pain and in the absence of knowing how to really love and connect without condition right yes, exactly. and then then we our behaviors will dictate yes, and, and what you're saying is something very important because it it hurts both sides. It, it does. The person that is being triggered as well as it is as it affects the other person. Yeah. I'm telling you because there are there are moments when I'm like, but I don't think they're bad. Why are we saying they're bad? What, what is bad about them? You know. Mm -hmm. that is, that's a judgment call, right? Yes. <laughs> and then you're like. Why am I even saying them? Is it us? It's, mm -hmm. it's us. Why are we them and and us and not all of us? So we say them and us because if they're doing the quote bad behavior, I'm better because I don't do that behavior, which means I have more value because I don't do that. I don't abuse alcohol like they do. I don't abuse drugs like they do. I'm better your worth now we've got that value and value translates in our brain to love and love is a basic human need without love you feel pain and you'll do anything to ease your pain so then it turns back into the behavior so it becomes this negative feedback loop exactly and then we we came to this world to love that is our number one and number one objective like just come to the world to love right and once and back to the basic needs once you're alive if you exist in this physical world in this existence right 
once that is established, like you are alive, love, that, that is what matters, you know? So when, when we boil it down to like the basic, I mean, I'm talking the most basic human needs, they're universal, right? We talk about, oh, everybody's different. We're all unique individuals and, you know, and that's all true, right? Um, and they're talking about like, you know, designer D's pharmaceuticals, you know, in the future and all that kind of stuff. Okay. You know, to fight a disease. Sure. But we are all human beings. We're, we are homo sapiens, right? You might be from Colombia and I might be from, you know, Maryland and someone else is black and someone else is Asian. It's like, but we're all homo sapiens and all homo sapiens, actually mammals, all homo sapiens have the same basic needs. Air, everybody needs air, right? Water, food, sleep, right? You go 24 hours without you are in a world of hurt. Yeah. And then we need safety and security. And once those basic physical needs are met, and I mean, at the most basic level, if those needs are met, you're alive, like you exist. Okay. And then right after that comes the emotional needs, which is love, connection, and belonging. But there are times when love, connection, and belonging will trump things like food, water, and sleep, right? You get dumped by your boyfriend and then you don't eat for a couple of days. You're not sleeping well. You might camp out in front of their apartment and, you know, in the rain, in the cold rain at night because of the unrequited love, the emotional need. That pain is trumping some of your physical needs for a time, you know? So when you get down to the real basics, you know, we're, we're, we're all just here to exist and love. And there is no, there's no gene, there's no hormone for evilness, right? There's no hormone for being bad, right? But there is a hormone specifically designed to love and connect, and that's oxytocin. So what you said before, we are here to love. It is literally in our biology, because when oxytocin is released in your body, it feels good, and you want more of it, yes. right? So we are designed to love. We are not designed to hate or be evil. But when we're in pain, it feels better to get angry and hate or, and hateful than to feel our pain of not being loved. Exactly. And then I think that one of the best examples, and, and I'm going to get it off track a little bit, is uh, when you have a pet. Mm -hmm. That is an unconditional love. And people say, well, you're feeding the animal. Yes, but Pets, usually, if you get sick, they will come and take care of you mm -hmm. in a way they naturally know how to take Yeah, because they're mammals. Yes. So they, they are not going to cook, as a human <laughs> being will do. But, for instance, I have cats, so they bring me lizards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Taking care of you. That's how they take care of you. Exactly. They're like, here, you are not eating well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but we see it in animals and, mm -hmm. and then we see that connection between humans and animals. And we oh, see yeah. that it's therapeutic to have an animal and a pet to love. Mm -hmm. And that's why, um, for, uh, and elderly, you know, they mm -hmm. usually bring the service dog or the service animal or people bring them a cat mm -hmm. to take care of because they are by themselves and they need something to something love. yeah something to love we we need that and personally i don't think there's anything that truly replaces human connection but we know from enough research that like people who have pets live longer and they're happier so yeah. You know, and it can be interspecies, right? I mean, you even see dogs taking care of elephants and, and, you know, cats taking care of a swan or, you know, whatever it is, you see these stories and it's even, you know, cross species. Like, 
we're mammals, you know, we have midbrain and have their, you know, cerebral cortex and their outer, you know, human brain, but all the mammals have their brainstem and the midbrain and our emotions and subconscious that's in our midbrain. And, and this is science. I mean, it's not yeah. this science. We're not even talking to talk. This is science and this is the way we are made. So when we see people hating at each other because mm. they are different, I, I was listening to a um, documentary uh, not too long ago about Hitler. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was behavioral. And they were saying that, and then they moved to a ne to a next, to something different, but it was, you know, mainly Hitler, but they moved to something different. I don't remember other story in the world and they will compare it to another and another. Mm -hmm. And they said, there is something in human beings. There is something that when they see different, they react. Mm -hmm. they react uh, but it's mostly for the communication that they have had around them right their environment that they were raised in so it is they have come to realize that scientifically differences are put in our brain not we don't we're not born with them um right so we see we we recognize differences between us and whatever else is in our environment yeah and and i think those differences you know as we evolved as a species you know something that's different it's unfamiliar it could be a threat you know it could be a threat to our survival so we're we're weary of it you know, and and I, I really think this goes back to, you know, millennia. I mean, humans have been on this planet for 200,000 years and it goes all the way back to that. And our survival, <laughs> you only have to go back about 150 years, the late 1800s. I mean, honestly, it's really 75 years like two, but let's just be conservative and say, go back 150 years, the late 1800s. And in that time, humans could not reliably source food. We could not reliably preserve food. We didn't have refrigerators back then, right? And we didn't even know if we were gonna make it through the winter, right? I mean, that was the reality, 1870, 1880, 1890. That's the reality. So if your physical existence is in question, I don't care about your need for love and connection. We need food. Like, I, I don't care if my kid's crying because he got a surf. Like, suck it up because you got to go chop some wood or we're going to be freezing cold tonight, you know? So, so prioritizing emotional health, it was never a priority because even up until the late 1800s, we didn't even know if we were going to survive. Yeah. So nothing else mattered. But now, Post World War II, when you know grocery stores didn't start happening until the 1950s, you know otherwise you could just go to your local mercantile or you know the corner market. You might go to the butcher here market. and yes. yeah, you know, and and you might have enough vegetables in your own garden and whatever, and that could, you might have your own chickens and and a cow to milk milk the cow. But so it's only in the last 75 years that survival on a day-to-day -day basis is not really in question. Now, take that with a grain of salt, because that's really only for 20% of the world. Yes. For 80% of the world, they don't have enough food and water in a given day. I mean, you can look these numbers up in, in the, in the you know, research. Yes. So survival is still a big problem for most of the world. But for the, for the first world countries that day-to-day -day survival is not a problem they're self-destructing through our behavior because we don't even know how to love and connect because it's so new that we've needed to love and connect to move forward exactly 
And talking about love and connect, that is exactly what you're after. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about Uchi. So Uchi is just my solution to helping people feel heard and understood by those closest to them, right? It's not about connecting with everybody, which is what social media tries to do. And we know where that's going for people, right? There's so much negative effects of that. But with Uchi, it's all about sharing your perspective based on questions from the app, which the questions are all over the place. Um, fun, insightful. It's not therapy and it's not trying to get you to reveal your deep, dark secrets. It's trying to help understand your perspective on whatever topic it happens to be. And by sharing your perspective, and hearing the perspective of people close to you, family, friends, maybe some coworkers or classmates or something, when we each have a chance to feel heard and understood and to share our thoughts and feelings, now we get to know each other. We get to understand each other. We get to love each other. And we feel loved because we feel heard and understood. And that's, it's so simple. It's almost too simple. But it works. I've, I've used it. It's been used in so many different applications. It's been used in schools. It's been used in universities. It's been used in juvenile court systems. It's been used in businesses, families, friends, sports teams. It's just about connecting, you know, and we only use the written word because it's really amazing what people are willing to write when you have time to write than it is to speak in real time, whether it's in person or in a video call or, you know, on the telephone. Um, with Uchi, it's only the written word. So you have time, you know, you can settle down your emotions if you get to something or if you're not sure you have time and you have time to read what the other people are writing. And when you have time to read, it's like, oh, let me read that again. Let me read that a third time. Oh, I missed a word. Let me read it again. Oh, it has a whole new meaning now. But you can't do that in real-time conversation. If you miss a word in real-time conversation, you might get triggered, and now you're into an argument. Yes. Right? Yes. So that's with Uchi. And the, the two most important aspects of Uchi are you can only read the answers of your Uchi friends. So you have to be connected with someone. There's nothing public about Uchi. So you can only read the energy friends and you can only read their answer if you've already answered that question first. So you have to contribute in order to consume, which is the opposite of social media where everybody, everybody's blasting out, but most is not getting any real interaction. Um, and tell us how people can get the Uchi app. Yeah, so Uchi is free to download on the App Store and Google Play. Um, the website is uchiconnection.com, and you can learn more about it there. It's free, you know, for anyone to use. And there's a whole database of questions that you can, you know, pull from. Um, and then the, the revenue side, because, you know, you have to make money in a business, of course, and there's no ads or anything like that. And we don't mine any of the data or anything like that. Um, if you want to come up with your own questions that are specific to your group of people, which doesn't have to be part of your regular Uchi network, you can be, it can be a whole separate group. But if you have questions specific for your family or your group of friends, or if you're a teacher, do it for your class, or if you're a, a, a manager and you want to do it for your team at work, or start to, you know, have people from different teams connecting, you can come up with your own questions, pay a small fee, come up with your own questions, and invite a little subset of people, and that's called an Uchi tribe. Oh, that is you just do it again and again and again. Oh, this is amazing. So um, how is this working? Is this working for middle school and high school? We haven't actually done it with middle school, although I do know people as young as seven have used the Uchi platform with no problem at all. But I haven't been into a middle school yet, and we have been at the high school level with like, oh my God, in less than two weeks, the teachers are seeing noticeable improvements in behavior with just the most minimal use of Uchi. 
it's it's amazing, you know. And we've been at the university level. There's all kinds of testimonials on the website um, at all levels, but you know, and then at the family level, right? don't even feel connected people feel lonely and isolated even when they live under the same roof as their family yes and we had a father write in a while back and he said you know thank you so much for this platform my 12 year old daughter has not spoken to my ex-wife in more than a year and within a week of using uchi they started talking again you said something very important, and I, if, if there are any teachers listening in high school, that middle school <laughs> or middle school, yeah, elementary school, <laughs> <laughs> there is a um, very common behavior in high schoolers and middle schoolers um, that they don't feel like they belong and they feel like outsiders. Mm -hmm. And if your app helps, I think that it will be very interesting and very useful for these schools, for schools to explore the possibility of using your app mm -hmm. and, and, and then help bring togetherness. Uh, Absolutely. One of the things exactly is one of the things is, is that when you teach your kids, it's just this little bit of who they will become, but it stay, stays in them. In a school, also their friends and their teachers are, are great. Um, they, you know, they, they put like a, like a footstone on them. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember my fifth grade teacher, <laughs> Miss Waki, and, um, her name was Joaquina, but, um, everybody called her Joaquin, and I remember her how she was so emotionally uh, welcoming. And she cared, and you felt it. Cared exactly, and there was I remember there was one girl that was so crazy and mischievous, and she didn't treat her differently. Right. She was totally like the same and come here, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to encourage everybody to explore the app. It is amazing. Kevin, tell me what is about, tell me a little bit about the book that you wrote and a little bit of the story of how you came up with it. Oh, the book. So the book is called Innovate the 1%. And that that's really based on like my biomedical engineering career and um, what I found and learned about how to innovate because we were innovating like crazy in, on my team. And what I learned, there's like seven lessons that I learned through that. And and basically, the reason it's innovate the one percent is because part of my job at this company was to receive disclosure ideas from surgeons. So I would formally document their idea and explore it and determine if it was feasible to move forward. And in the almost eight years that I was at this company, I accepted more than four hundred disclosures. So more than four hundred ideas from world-renowned surgeons right from all over the place all over the world and they were world-renowned and of the over 400 disclosures that i documented only four turned into marketed products so that's one percent that is one percent one percent so that's why i call it innovate the one percent however me and my team I, I have 80 patents and, you know, like 75 of them came from that one company, the work that we were doing at that one company, because we, you know, we were in it day in and day out. We're solving problems. You know, surgeons are visiting patients and doing rounds and doing surgery and reading up on the latest techniques and diseases. I mean, they've got a lot going on. Their expertise is not just solving problems day in and day out. Right. Yeah. That's what we would do. And. You know, the seven lessons are in there and chapter two 
really talks about how much we loved working with each other. I mean, we had a freaking blast going to work every day. We had so much fun. We really enjoyed each other. And it didn't matter if we had an idea that was terrible. We didn't think, oh, you're an idiot. You have no value. <laughs> we would just be like, oh, okay, that doesn't work. Let's try something else. Or what can I turn with your bad idea? Let me turn it into something good. And I mean, I can tell you story after story. And, and that's what this book, you know, has real stories of real inventions, how they came to be. Um, and then, you know, some of the effects, you know, like generating billions of dollars in revenue or, or saving hundreds of thousands of lives and, and so on. Uh, but chapter two is all about the relationships that we felt like we loved each other, you know, like we would even say it at work. Oh, you can't say love. You can't be emotional at work. <laughs> well, if you don't talk about love and emotion at work, that is going to stifle, almost completely stop innovation, productivity, um, engagement, retention, culture, right? Yes. We loved each other. So all that stuff was like, we were just having a, a Exactly. And then, you know, um, that reminds me of something that happens in um, many times at work and is the counseling culture. Mm -hmm. And um, how that is not driven by love. And when, when people say, I do what I love and I love what I, I do, it is perfect because you're talking about I. How about the people that are around you that help you and collaborate yeah. with you day by day? Absolutely. And just, I was saying we, we, we when I was just talking. I mean, we can go back in the transcript and see if that's really what I was saying. But I think I was saying we loved each other. Yes, exactly. And so one of the things that I wanted to pick your brain today is, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in corporations. Is big, but I don't think we we are realizing that it starts at home. Oh yeah, I, I I mean I think everything starts at home, right? I mean most of our like eighty five percent of our brain is like and personality is like dialed in by the time you're six years old, yeah. right? So if we raise our kids on conditional love, not the unconditional love of the pets that we were talking about earlier. <laughs> But if we raise our kids on conditional love, then what what we're teaching them is, is if you don't perform and if you don't do the behavior that I want you to do, you're bad. You don't have value. You're not loved. And that's the that's the imprint. That is the belief system, which is another chapter in the book, by the way. That's the system that you're operating from. It's all in your subconscious. Because before six, you're not self-aware. You don't know anything about self-love before you're six years old. So that's what sets in. And here's an example about conditional love. Oh, Maritza, she's such a good girl. She went in the potty today. Yay, Maritza, right? Oh, Kevin, he's a bad boy. He didn't go in the potty. He went in his pants. He's a bad boy. No lollipop for Kevin. That's judgment. That's shame. That's little t trauma. That's emotional trauma. It's real. It causes stress. It causes cortisol to pump through your body. And, you know, if you've got cortisol pumping through the other, like, negative hormones that are pumping through your body all the time, you know what it does to your brain chemistry? It changes your brain chemistry. Right? So then we wonder why kids at three years old are getting diagnosed with clinical depression. And their brain chemistry is off because of their environment. Things very rarely spontaneously go awry. And like we said earlier, there's no gene or hormone for evilness. No. Kids don't want to be bad. They want to love. Right? Do you remember that video of the little black boy and the little white boy who are running to each other with their arms on the street? Yeah. They're like, yay, we love each other. Yeah. That's what we are designed to do. And you know, that is, that is amazing because... Um, I had the opportunity to have a friend who has a special need kid, and he is not functional. He is, um, he doesn't talk. 
And my daughter was two years, it's, she's two years younger than him. And she was two years, two years old. Mm-hmm. And they came to visit us. And of course, my friend's boy is sitting there and they're playing. And when he goes to talk, he makes a noise. And she looks at me and she's, what is he saying? She didn't, she didn't get a scare. She didn't say, mommy, why is he screaming? She just asked me, what is he saying? She was curious. Immediately recognized that is the way he communicates. Mm-hmm. So that is, that is proof that we are not, we, we are not born wired to differentiate mm-hmm. and discriminate. Right. We're not. We're designed We're not. to love. Yeah. You know, we're designed to connect. And, 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 and if it gets violated and we are threatened in some way, you know, and, but we're raising our kids in these conditional shame, judgment, degradate, degrading and emotionally neglecting environments. And we think we're toughening them up and don't cry and put your big boy pants on. But all of that, I consider that to be little t trauma. You know, we hear about trauma all the time. And now generational trauma is like the big thing in the last six months. Ever? Oh, it's generational. It's generational down in our DNA. Okay, well, that's true. Like, I mean, they've shown studies that yeah. generational trauma, it, trauma does get passed down in our genes or our DNA. But what we're missing is how we are regularly raising our children, and then it's reinforced in school and it's reinforced in the workplace with yeah. little t trauma which is basically like death by a thousand cuts all day long. And just saying I love you at the end of the day when you put your kid to bed does not undo a whole day's worth of shame, judgment, degradation, and emotional neglect. It doesn't make your kid weak to validate their feelings and to even acknowledge their feelings and just to listen and not finish their sentence for them let them be heard. They need, and they have to learn. How else are they going to learn? Yeah, I love that. So, and that, that is another important point. Um, we're not perfect because we're not perfect. So no. we're, we're far from perfect. And nobody's a hundred percent good and nobody's a hundred percent evil. Even Hitler had his inner circle that, you know, he took care of. Yes. And, but going back to parenting, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be perfect. And you're going to have bad days. And especially between two and, and four when they have all those tantrums, <laughs> um, you're not going to react the way you have to react. Mm-hmm. And that at the moment because maybe you had a bad day Mm -hmm. and it's okay to admit that to your child it doesn't mean you're a bad parent Exactly. right you're just recognizing that look i'm doing the best that i can we're both feeling triggered i'm upset you're upset let's just sit here together and be upset and it's okay to be upset we're not bad for being upset we don't have less value because we got upset we won't be less loved Exactly, and sometimes also it's good to just recognize and and say you're sorry if you overpass your boundaries because we're humans. That's one of the most important things we can do, I think, as parents and teachers and bosses is to admit and say, you know what, I messed up. I was wrong. I messed up. I'm sorry, and I'm going to try and do better next time now that I know. Yes. It is very important. And then you mentioned as bosses also, because mm-hmm. sometimes, um, sometimes there are workplaces where you need to be a type A personality or type A plus plus. <laughs> and, and you might get a little screamy. And I'm, well, I'm not, I shouldn't say you. And the person might get. I understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but what makes you a real leader? is the coming back and saying, I overpassed my boundaries. 
-hmm. and I should have never done this uh, and value the person and mm -hmm. recognize your mistake. That is what makes the leader. Ah. Yeah. yeah, and then it, it makes it okay for them to make this mistake and, and they don't feel threatened or devalued as a person, not loved, right, as a person. So then their emotional health remains intact, right? And then their behavior will show that. Behaviors are just symptoms. Behaviors are just a massive way to communicate. So if you ever want to understand how a person is feeling, just look at their behavior. And what I've seen is the more extreme the behavior, the deeper the emotional pain. So it could be it could be the heroin and the alcohol, right? Your feelings with ice cream, you know? <laughs> or it can be the extremely constructive, like the type A, the A plus, the A plus plus, the overachiever. That's another way that that person is just trying to feel valued. It's like going in the potty, right? Like if I, if I perform, then I get love. If I don't perform, then I don't have any value and I won't be loved. And to your point about um, the boss, quick story, I'll try to make it quick. Um, and this is in the book, but there was one time that I was working on a problem and I had a really long commute to work. It was like 75 minutes each day. And I was working through this whole problem on my, and I was like, oh my God, I got it figured out. Like, this is going to be amazing. And I was really working through it. And it was like, finally, and I get to work and I just drop my stuff down. I don't even take my coat off and I don't put my lunch in the refrigerator. I just immediately go to the whiteboard and I'm like, oh my God, Larry, you know, one of the men on my team, I was like, oh my God, you got to see this. And I drew out this whole diagram and I made it look all exactly like I wanted. I'm like, Larry, I got it. I got it. I figured it out. We, we, this is it. And he looks at me and, he, and he's looking at the drawing and he's like, all right, all right. I see, I see where you're going. And he says, but what about this over here? And I'm like, oh man, you're right. It doesn't work at all. And I just, the whole thing, and we just went about our day. So he pointed out a complete blunder of his boss, I was his boss. He yeah. completely was like, Kevin, that doesn't work at all. Like you completely missed the target. And I was like, yep, you're right. I missed it. Let's just move on. And we just moved on. Yes, and it's it's easy to, and, and one of the things is that what makes a team, sometimes the boss it's is the person, the leader that takes the group together or not sometimes that's what it is that brings the group together and um allows the flow of, of ideas to to go yeah. but it's not always the smartest person in the room absolutely it shouldn't it doesn't have to be right i mean the, the boss is just i mean that's like a title but anybody can be a leader you know you can be Wherever you are in the hierarchy, again, we go back to this hierarchy. Yeah. If, you're, if you're the CEO, if you're at the top of the hierarchy, you have more value. Everybody in the company has value. Everybody in the class has value. Everybody in the family has value. But what do we say about kids? Oh, no, you need to be seen and not heard. You don't have any value yet, yeah. right? Yeah. So... This is how we're raising, and this is how it gets reinforced time and again, you know, and all the grades and test scores and class rankings and what university you go to, or God forbid, you don't go to university and you go to trade school, you have less value in our society. And, and that is harming the emotional health of that person. And then that's their identity. That's the belief system that they end up operating from. And then I'll take that all the way back to the diversity, equity, inclusion. When we, when we think like, oh, a man has more value than a woman, more than black, um, Christian over Jew, Republican over Democrat, I mean, like rich over poor, like we, we, comp we keep valuing people of, for these arbitrary, you know, um, criteria. Every human is valuable. We are all a unique, wonderful energy in the universe. Everybody has value. And until we recognize that and acknowledge it and embrace it and live it, 
we're going to continue to self-destruct, which means hurting ourselves or hurting others, because we, and that's the diversity, equity, and we're devaluing those that aren't deemed valuable. And, and it really hurts everybody. Exactly. And I, one of, one of the things, and probably many people are not going to um, like this, but I think that even the bigger corporations that have a DEI um, department, I don't think that when there is a pro- the problem arises, they really don't know what to do. I don't think, you know, they think, oh, we'll do a training. Or we'll put up a poster or we'll put out an email to everyone saying, hey, everybody be civil, everybody be kind. But when does telling someone to do a behavior actually result in the person just doing the behavior? I mean, come on. We had a war. We had a civil war in the United States about slavery, right? Yeah. That's it. No, you know, slaves, you know, black people are equal to white people. We had a war about it. We have the 13th Amendment, which passed by only one vote. But just mandating doesn't change the, the way that people in the South viewed. It wasn't like, here's the, the movement to the Constitution, and then all of a sudden the entire South was like, oh, black people are equal to white people. No. But when we actually, it all kind of breaks down when you actually get to know the person as a person. Right. There's a wonderful man by the name of Daryl Davis, a black man out of the Washington, D.C. area, a little bit older than me, who has gone around the country and he has befriended KKK members. He's actually made friends with KKK. Have you heard of this? No. So he actually went out, sought out KKK members, became friends, and got them to quit the KKK. And how does he do it? I mean, you can watch a documentary on this and you can oh, wow. watch, you know, um, how did he do it? He started by listening to their perspective. They felt heard. They felt understood. They felt valued by Daryl. And then they were willing to listen to Daryl's side and get to know Daryl as a person. And the more they got to know each other for the people that they are, the real people, which is about love, right? Yeah. They became friends, and they're like, "Oh, this KKK stuff is is not the right way. This isn't the this isn't good for this isn't adding to it. It's detracting from society." And it's the same approach with like white supremacists. I, I forget the man's name, Christian something, um, who quit the white supremacist groups because of the same thing, the same way. And this is you know kind of a sort of seems like a big gap, but that's what Uchi's about, getting to know people for the person that they are. And once you develop that relationship, we're all pretty wonderful, it really, is. at our core. What a beautiful message, Kevin. It is true. And whoever you are out there to our audience, if you're in this world, is because you're meant to be. You are not nobody needs to be a superhero but we are little teeny superheroes in our lives and you were made with love no matter what the circumstances brought you to this world love brought you to life and i would like to close this with something from you and i really I love this conversation. I can see us talking again and making another episode. It it was wonderful and beautiful. And really, I really value you as a champion of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. I, this is a joy. I think we went longer than what we were planning. Um, but it was so much fun. You're a wonderful listener. I felt heard. You know, which makes me feel really good. So thank you for that. And if we can just get this message out and help people understand and we'll just make the world easier and better for everyone. Exactly. So everybody, your accent is no accident. Your love and you're meant to be here. See you later.
Hi, it's Maritza here. If you like this episode of My Accent is No Accident podcast and would like to listen more like this, subscribe wherever you're listening to it or watching it. Leave us a nice review and share with your friends, family, and network. Thanks for listening. Hello.